<laughs> All right, everyone. Welcome to 1013. Thanks for coming out this evening. Um, for those who have been following very closely, and I appreciate it, all the support, um, the uh, Dole Ham case. Uh, just a quick update that, um, as you know, they, we, well, Dole, Dole Ham is alive. So, uh, and um, unlikely to be resentenced to another execution in the next couple of months, at least. Um, he actually, the, the Supreme Court at the last minute lifted, did, didn't grant a stay. And so, um, as a legal matter, we, I mean, you know, we lost the case. Um, and he was uh, then taken into the execution chamber and strapped down to the gurney. And for somewhere around an hour and a half to two and a half hours, I mean, there was two and a half hours where he was, they were trying to find a vein uh, on him and ultimately did not succeed. And so he walked out of the execution chamber uh, at 11.27 on Thursday night. He's the only person in the history of the death penalty who has uh, been strapped into the gurney and who they tried to get peripheral veins uh, on his legs and then they tried to do a central venous access uh, in his groin, and he walked out alive, traumatized, um, but alive. So that's where the case is now, and um, I do appreciate all of your support and all of the all of the emails and um, and letters uh, that I received, that the governor received. Um, uh, the The governor never. Uh, actually never really got back to me on our clemency petition. Uh, she refused to see me in person. And on Thursday, actually, I never heard back from them. So uh, your letters weren't in vain, uh, although uh, they didn't, um, I'm not sure the seriousness which was they were taken, sadly. Uh, but in any event, so uh, Doyle is alive, and he's deeply grateful for everything that everyone has done uh, on his behalf. Thank you. So we're here today to explore certain notions, um, certain notions of anti-imperialism and of national independence that marked many of the revolutionary uprisings in Latin and South America during the mid-20th century. Um, and we're doing so as a vehicle also to interrogate more contemporary forms of uprising associated with the notions of autonomia, uh, also perhaps more simply with the notion of insurrection, um, but also with the idea of self-determination, all of these notions which have become more current in the last couple of decades. Our inquiry is going to focus on the following kinds of questions. First. How does anti-imperialism, as one central dynamic of uprising, change the course of revolutionary practice? What work does it do uh, in relation to the modern concept of revolution? Uh, a second question, is there something more to anti-imperialism than the fact that many of the regimes against which people fought in Central and South America were supported by the United States government and the CIA? In other words, was what is there to anti-imperialism that is more than merely the geopolitical context of the particular uprising? A third cluster of uh, questions could be about the relationship between these notions and the anti-capitalist and wealth and land redistributional character uh, of these uprisings and of these uh, political regimes that come into place. So we might want to ask, what are the land reforms, uh, are the land reforms in some sense autonomous from uh, the anti-imperialism, or what is, what is the connection? Um, other set of questions would be, how have the social democratic forms of governing that took hold in many countries, Venezuela, Bolivia, Uruguay, since the late 1990s, um, 
the, uh, the kinds of uh, forms of governing that uh, Macarena Gomez Baris discusses under the title the, the Pink Tide relate to these goals of autonomy, self-determination, or anti-imperialism. Now, of course, anti-imperialism is not limited to the South Americas, naturally, uh, and for this reason we have invited on this panel experts as well on Africa and Eastern Europe and Asia. And to help us guide us in these investigations, we're delighted to have four brilliant scholars with us, uh, Andrew Arato, uh, Yvonne Del Valle, uh, Macarena Gomez Baris, and Juan Obario. And I'll introduce them in the order in which they will be uh, speaking this evening. Uh, Andrew Arato, uh, to my immediate right, is the Dorothy Hart Hirshhorn Professor in Political and Social Theory uh, in the uh, Sociology Department at the New School for Social Research. He's a prolific author, and uh, his, among his books are, uh, most recently, The Adventures of the Constituent Power, Beyond Revolutions, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2017, uh, as well as Post-Sovereign Constitution Making, Learning and Legitimacy from Oxford 2016, Constitution Making Under Occupation, The Politics of Imposed Revolution in Iraq from Columbia in 2009, From Neo-Marxism to Democratic Theory, Essays on the Critical Theory of Soviet-Type Societies, and among others, The Young Lukács and The Origins of Western Marxism. Professor Arato has served as a consultant for the Hungarian Parliament uh, on constitutional issues, uh, and he's also been a U.S. State Department democracy lecturer and consultant uh, on constitutional issues in Nepal. And uh, he is also uh, was reappointed by the State Department uh, in that capacity for Zimbabwe in November of 2010, uh, where he had uh, discussions with civil society activists and political leaders in charge of the constitution-making process. Uh, after Professor Arato, we'll hear from Yvonne Del Valle, uh, who is a professor of colonial studies at uh, UC Berkeley. Her research and teaching make uh, these connections between the colonial past and the present, uh, and they show the relevance of the colonial period for our understanding of contemporary times. Uh, she's the co-director of the Berkeley research group Mexico and the Rule of Law, and she's author, the author of both a book and a series of articles on the Jesuits, Jose de Acosta and Loyola, and Jesuits in the northern borderlands of New Spain, uh, and uh, focusing on a particular, on the way in which they were of particular influence on the political religious order that served modernization and the expansion of the Spanish Empire. Uh, she's currently working on two projects, uh, one on the drainage of the lakes of Mexico City, uh, and the other on the role of the colonization of Spanish America from the 15th century onward in the development of new epistemologies and political theories. And in this latter project, uh, she's exploring the ways in which both the unprecedented violence of conquest and colonization and the need for effective administration of the colonies brought about important theoretical, technological, and epistemological changes which may have been conceived uh, to be put in place in the colonies, but which in the long run transformed the way Europe understood and fashioned itself. Uh, after that, we'll hear from Professor Juan Obario, uh, who is a professor of anthropology at John Hopkins University. Uh, he's the author most recently of The Spirit of the Laws in Mozambique, uh, University of Chicago Press, and uh, Corps Etranger, uh, and also the forthcoming book, uh, a Matter of Time, A Secret State of Things in Northern Mozambique. Uh, he is as well the co-editor of African Futures, Essays on Crisis, Emergence, and Possibilities in 2016. He's received fellowships from the MacArthur Foundation, from the Ford Foundation, Social Science Research Council, and the American Council of Learned Societies. And he's the editor of the new journal, Critical Times, uh, which is uh, about to be uh, published by the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs. Um, Juan Obario is also the founding director of the program on Global South Studies at the University of San Martin in Buenos Aires and has worked on program building fostering South-South uh, academic collaborations. Uh, after uh, Professor Obario, um, uh, Professor Macarena Gomez Barres will both intervene and comment, hopefully, on the, 
on the discussion uh, this evening. Uh, Professor Gomez Barres is chairperson of the Department of Social Science and Cultural Studies at Pratt Institute and director of the Global South Center. Uh, she is the author of The Extractive Zone, Social Ecologies and Decolonial Perspectives, uh, which uh, just appeared with Duke University Press 2017, and uh, a book that theorizes social life through five extractive scenes of ruinous capitalism upon indigenous territories. Uh, she's also the author of the very forthcoming, it should be out very soon, if I'm correct, yes? Um, uh, Beyond the Pink Tide, Art and Politics in the Americas uh, with University of California Press, um, as well as Where Memory Dwells, Culture and State Violence in Chile, uh, also from the University of California Press. She is the co-editor uh, of uh, E Misferica and uh, co-editor of um, Towards a Sociology of a Trace. Um, so we are blessed to have a, 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 a brilliant panel who will uh, first uh, uh, present their works. You've had an opportunity to read some of their posts, their posts already, um, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Professor Arato. Thank you very much, uh, oh, okay. uh, Bernard, for uh, inviting me to this really exciting uh, 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 seminar and for your uh, generous uh, uh, introduction. Uh, I must admit, when you first invited me, I, I just looked at the general topic and I thought, well, uh, I should really address the issue of, of revolution, which is what uh, I've written on several, on several occasions. But uh, I looked more closely and I saw anti-imperialism there and I was thinking, how is that going to work? How can I actually bring it in? I spent uh, about 10 days ago, two weeks in Cuba, and that sort of uh, helped to focus, uh, focus my, uh, my mind. And, uh, and, and I think uh, I'd be able to speak about the issue of anti-imperialism along with revolution. Uh, 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 because in part of that, of that experience, and of course, uh, in part what people uh, told me. I, 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 it's very hard to follow Cuban affairs in the American press, but I think uh, uh, I, all of you realize that since uh, uh, 1990 or so, there have been very deep economic uh, uh, problems having to do with the collapse of, uh, of the relation to the Comic-Con and to the Soviet economy. Uh, in effect, uh, uh, the response to that has been to, to create uh, four economies in the place of what originally was one, uh, and, and I'm not going to go into it, but, but that has created a context in which there is a great deal of, uh, of opportunity for rent-seeking in between these various economies and uh, transfers between them. A lot of irrationality, like engineers driving cabs because they want to be in the economy where you can actually uh, make dollar equivalent uh, uh, money. And as a result, uh, significant inequality already. You can imagine in a place which still has some kind of socialist ideology and where almost everyone is attached to what they refer to as the welfare achievements of the system, that kind of inequality is, is, is difficult to uh, uh, to contain. Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, everywhere I kind of tend to think uh, uh, significant change uh, would be a good idea, and in Cuba I think it is almost inevitable that there will be such change. I thought right away about what form that would take, and of course, uh, having written about uh, transitions a lot, I, I have a preferred, uh, a preferred model. That preferred model is the negotiated transition that has emerged uh, uh, in, in, in Spain, Central Europe, and, and, and South Africa involving ground tables and so on. What would that look like in Cuba? What would be the outcome? And, and, and clearly, uh, uh, Cubans I talked to uh, in, in such uh, a context would immediately tell me we would be in defense, we would not be able to defend the, uh, the, the positive aspects of the uh, of, uh, of, of, of Cuban developments and our integrity in, in the context of such a, uh, uh, such, a, uh, such a model. So I had to kind of 
try to become more critical in terms of also my own conception, but uh, uh, in, in spite of that, of course, uh, uh, I, uh, I would like to maintain it and reconstruct it, and that's what this presentation is, is mostly about. You can read the whole thing on uh, a much longer version, obviously, on the blog, so I will watch my time and not to go through uh, every little uh, detail of this. Uh, the first step of the argument and I'm, you know, some of you here may be shocked to hear me say it, is that what liberals and conservatives have said about revolution in the 19th century has been basically right. That is, the logic of revolution is indeed what they have said, and the 20th century confirmed it. Uh, uh, you know, in the 19th century, they pointed to uh, the, uh, the incredible uh, uh, consequences of revolutionary civil war, the repression, the destruction of subaltern class, uh, classes, some of them even pointed to, that's mostly the anarchist critics, uh, to the destruction of, uh, uh, of direct democratic uh, uh, forms of experimentation, uh, purges, and of course, uh, dictatorship. Uh, I don't want to say, and someone can do a large end study at some point if they wish, I don't want to say that every revolution or even uh, the average revolution has all these consequences, but I think that what has been called the, the great 20th century revolution certainly have confirmed, uh, uh, confirmed that uh, particular, uh, particular critique. Uh, now, what is behind uh, uh, all this? And, and, and I think uh, 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 it's, it's relatively easy to say uh, that uh, uh, that a, uh, a form of logic which Marx already in 1843 affirmed, uh, although he thought the socialist revolution would be exempt from it, uh, namely uh, the representation of the whole by a part, uh, 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 is uh, responsible uh, for, uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, the revolutionary, uh, revolutionary dynamic. Today you see a reappearance of this non-revolutionary forms under uh, many versions of populism, but all uh, revolutions uh, 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 at least in the 20th century, uh, have uh, uh, reproduced this uh, parse uh, uh, prototo logic, uh, uh, which Marx uh, uh, tried to emancipate himself from, but certainly Lenin and Lukács uh, uh, reaffirmed it, uh, making the part really a part of a part, namely the, uh, uh, the, vanguard, uh, the vanguard party. Now, I think that if this were all to revolution, uh, uh, it would have died uh, uh, at death before the 20th century, uh, 20th century uh, revolutions. At least empirically speaking, revolutions would of course occur, but the normative concept of revolution uh, would not uh, uh, be able to maintain itself. And this is where the innovation of Lenin comes in, and this is where I can link myself to the topic, because Lenin discovered uh, anti-imperialism as a significant uh, dimension of the of the, of the revolutionary problem. It's easy enough to discover it, of course, in a context which was understood as the prison house of nations, uh, Tsarist Russia, but he uh, uh, much more boldly than, uh, than any other socialist theorist of the time extended this, uh, uh, this conception internationally, not only in his book on imperialism, but elsewhere too. Uh, as I say very polemically, and I'm sure some of you won't like this, uh, in, the, in the blog entry, he thereby uh, extended the life of, of a highly problematic model of social change for another hundred years. And I think even the Islamic Revolution, uh, though not in the Leninist tradition, uh, in the most direct ideological sense, uh, uh, stands uh, uh, within the model uh, of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the revolutionary logic on the one hand, uh, as, I, uh, as I described it, and anti-imperialism, anti-imperialism on the other. Now, in my argument, uh, and it has uh, three more steps, uh, what uh, uh, the question is, of course, uh, uh, what should be the alternative? Are there any alternatives to, uh, to, uh, uh, to revolution in the classical sense and its logic? Uh, I think uh, uh, without anyone having invented it on paper, uh, uh, political uh, 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 transformation from the 1970s on uh, did generate uh, did generate such a model. Uh, unlike uh, 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 the implication of liberal and conservative critique of revolution, this model uh, uh, produced uh, dramatic uh, uh, 
uh, social change, in fact, regime changes in, uh, in a whole host of countries. I don't know what your attitude is to the post-transition uh, 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 regimes uh, all over the world, but certainly uh, liberal democracy in Spain is not Franco's, is not the Franco's regime. Uh, the South African uh, 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 democracy is not the apartheid regime, and even the Central European regimes are no longer uh, 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 regimes of the Soviet type. So in a sense, uh, a method was generated which accomplished uh, transformation on the order of what historical revolutions have accomplished. But it has done so in all the cases without uh, the logic of civil war, the logic of uh, repression and suppression of all classes, without the logic of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 destroying significant uh, uh, dimensions of the revolutionary cadre uh, and the revolutionary uh, movement itself, uh, without, in fact, dictatorship, because uh, none of them, uh, none of the successor uh, regimes after 1970, uh, down to, well, uh, that may be, uh, uh, may be a little too much to, uh, to claim, but most of them certainly cannot be characterized, whatever their flaws, as, as dictatorships. So something really significant, significant has been gained. The next step of the argument, and this is where the self-critical dimension comes in, what has been lost? As Cubans tell you, uh, there are a lot of gains of the revolution, but when they actually, in questionnaires, are asked, uh, what is the concept around which you would, uh, uh, you would uh, locate those gains, it's almost never socialism. Yes, I think they're attached to uh, uh, whatever welfare achievements have been made, although they are now precarious. But the most important dimension to them is that uh, the resistance of the resistant imperialism has been achieved by the, by the revolutionary regime. And, and to this, I think there is almost general attachment. I'm not sure if, it, if it's universal in Cuba now, given the crisis, but still very large uh, 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 parts of the Cuban population would not like to surrender uh, not like to surrender uh, the, uh, uh, the achievement of being able to protect this small country from its pre-revolutionary, uh, from the restoration of its pre-revolutionary history, the Batista uh, uh, regime uh, uh, represents to them uh, the nightmare which could come about uh, uh, in the context of, of a transition. And looking at East Europe, uh, in my uh, blog entry, uh, I try to indicate this uh, uh, quite graphically by focusing on Germany, of all places, looking at, at those places, uh, they say, well, the model of transformation may have achieved certain things. Liberal democracy would be nice if we could have it. But look, look what happens to the indigenous uh, political uh, uh, energies and, uh, and, and creativity and, uh, uh, and, and political participation even. When you have a West Germany, and the Cubans have it, it's in Miami. Uh, there's great fear uh, that uh, in the context of, uh, of a transformation of the type that uh, uh, we have seen in Eastern Europe uh, and Central, uh, in, in Central Europe uh, and uh, even to some extent South Africa, uh, the external factor uh, is not going to be uh, resisted in a way that the revolutionary transformation itself has, has, has resisted it. Uh, and I think one can go a little bit further than just a German example, because after all, in the Central European countries, there is no Western Hungary or Western uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. But the presence of international institutions uh, uh, in, uh, in steering one dimension of the transition is so clear uh, that uh, uh, one cannot find uh, positive models there. I was kind of interested where the Cubans, and I don't want to go into this too much, where they are attracted by a Chinese model of transformation. I'm sure that people in the Communist Party are, if they could, if they could manage it. But still, I think uh, 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 to uh, uh, independent uh, 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 people outside, uh, uh, the continuation of, of a single-party dictatorship also does not look particularly, particularly attractive. So is there, is, there a, uh, uh, is there any kind of answer or is there any kind of alternative? Uh, and in my blog uh, entry, uh, I, in, in, I outline uh, uh, in some detail uh, what the alternative would be. Uh, first of all, I, 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 think, I do think that avoidance of revolutionary logic remains important, and I think that the model developed from Spain to South Africa avoids it, and in that sense, it should be built upon rather than, uh, rather than abandoned. 
But again, it's, uh, uh, it's possible weakness with respect to outside uh, intervention, imposition, undue influence, and so on, uh, is, uh, is to, be, to be taken seriously. And how can one, that's my question, how can one within that model uh, uh, avoid uh, that type of uh, neo-imperialist uh, uh, neo imperialist role? Uh, instead of trying to invent something, I, I guess I still always follow Rosa Luxemburg in this. I, 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 I leave invention to, to, uh, to social movements, uh, uh, political uh, initiatives, initiatives uh, of citizens outside, uh, and try to learn from them. And so the methodology of the paper is to try to take uh, examples uh, from the various transitions which I have studied, which represent elements that could be built upon and could be then incorporated in a new version. So just very short, because I, 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 I want to watch my time, and in the discussion we can speak about the details of this. Uh, I take uh, uh, the Moncloa Pact in Spain to be an extremely important device uh, by which not only actually you make peace in a setting in which uh, uh, there are uh, uh, quite different social forces uh, aside from uh, political movements and political parties contending for power, but also very different ideas of what society should look like. The Moncloa Pact represented a, uh, a set of arrangements around the economy. What will the economy look like uh, once we accomplish uh, a political transition, at least in the short run? And this was uh, uh, negotiated among quite di diver uh, diverse political forces in, uh, uh, in 19... Uh, 78 after the uh, first uh, uh, the first uh, uh, free free election. Now, interestingly, uh, and this, uh, this is the second step, step of my argument. Uh, a lot of people write about the Moncloa Pact, say, but it wasn't kept. A lot of aspects of it have been actually uh, uh, have been actually uh, violated by the uh, uh, the first government that was uh, uh, in power after the elections uh, led led by the conservatives. It's a long history because then so subsequent socialist governments try to restore aspects of it. But I think in this respect, the idea of constitutionalization, which actually should matter to us, a lot of us are interested in, in legal matters, uh, represents, uh, represents an option. In the Moncloa Pact was passed in the form of statutes by the Cortes, but it was not constitutionalized. And in that sense, uh, uh, a new majority could uh, uh, derogate from it without any impunity, without any uh, uh, violation, since one could see in a new economic situation there is no reason why one, can, one has to adhere to, uh, 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 to uh, those set of agreements which, for example, favored, favored labor. So constitutionalization, and here uh, my example uh, comes not from Spain, but from, uh, uh, paradoxically, East Germany and South Africa, East Germany where actually it was a round table which produced the constitution and a constitution which had social features which were quite dramatic because I'm not aware of any country outside of East Germany and South Africa where the state action problem has been solved in a way that, uh, uh, that these uh, efforts uh, tried to solve it. In other words, the state action problem, and you'll correct me because uh, I'm not a lawyer myself, the United States tends to mean, uh, if it's interpreted in a strong uh, sense, that rights cannot be claimed against private entities unless you can demonstrate the presence of state uh, role which allows those private entities to do, do what they're doing. In that sense, rights are not against the most powerful necessarily. They're, all, they're always against the state or the government, which in a lot of settings uh, uh, may not, uh, in the United States very often, uh, may not have very much freedom of action, and leaving those who have uh, 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 a great deal of economic power uh, uh, able to um, not only violate social rights, but also obviously uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of assembly, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, and, and so on, and indeed uh, uh, private rights of, uh, of, uh, of any kind. Uh, the, the, the tables of rights of both the East German and then the South African Constitution indicate that when there is broad participation by different social forces, uh, uh, very broad protections can be built into constitutions, which then, unlike the Spanish outcome, could be protected uh, against subsequent derogation. And my example of this uh, in the paper are several constitutional court cases in South Africa, which is still a very poor country, 
ever. Nevertheless, the Constitutional Court of South Africa has been able to defend right to health, right to housing in quite dramatic way against even the ANC, the ANC government. And so constitutionalization is the second step, and I leave uh, with the third step, which I think one sees evidence of both in the South African and in the East German cases, uh, broad participation by different uh, 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 groups of civil society beyond the Moncloa Pact, which was just capital and labor represented, indicates that constitutions also can be made which have very broad protections for, uh, for women's rights, for gender rights, for ecological uh, uh, achievements, and so on. And I think that uh, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, if one was trying to uh, make sure that outside forces, uh, indeed uh, outside economic forces uh, that have a great deal of political clout also domestically, don't interfere in our political development uh, uh, unduly or, uh, or uh, uh, to uh, an extent to abrogate uh, uh, our internal autonomy and independence, then uh, uh, these steps, uh, 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 economic partnership, uh, I know it has a corporatist uh, feel, but I think uh, that kind of, that dimension of corporatism is important, uh, constitutionalization, and an increasing involvement in the, uh, in the design process of civil society institutions uh, represent at least uh, a first uh, 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 set of criteria. There, must, there could be others uh, which we would have to collectively generate. Uh, which uh, uh, can guard against uh, uh, neo-imperialism, which, uh, which threatens, I think, all uh, uh, political transitions uh, uh, even today. Thanks right. a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Great. We, we have to move on, and, uh, and, but when we come back to you, I do want to kind of develop the, the, the issues of what it is that was, lo was lost and... and uh, in abandoning the, the anti-imperialism, which, which I think we, would be interesting to spend a little bit more time. But uh, Yvonne, um, and why don't you see if this works? Well, uh, thank you, Bernard, for the invitation, and thank you to Jesus, who's not here. Um, so I'll start where I left in my post, what I posted on, on the website, uh, those th uh, three photographs, two of um, uh, Fortino Samano, a Carrancista, and this is the Mexican Revolution, and, and the other one of uh, Pablo Lopez, uh, a Villista. And um, I, it's not as if what I posted was a false beginning for what I'm about to say, because it, it's taking an, it's going to, I'm going to take it in another direction, the direction that I said there at the end, that it, those pictures were not about men about to get killed. Uh, they're about life and politics. And I think it's important to say that precisely because of what um, we heard from Andrew Arato and his post, that many times revolutions have been considered a, a waste, no? And, and in the case of the Mexican Revolution, so many people died, you know? And, and um, so uh, there's lots of life lost, wasted, and um, supposedly also a politics that never came to be, so it's also pointless politics. So I would like to refocus that and take it in another direction. And I'll do that by thinking about, uh, I'm, I'm in literature, so I'm sorry, but this is a, a two texts. One of them is from the 17th century. It was written by Carlos de Sigüenza y Góngora. And it's, it's a text that addresses a corn riot in 1692. I think I said it already. Um, so, and it's the most important uprising in Mexico City during the colonial period. And the other one, uh, there are different texts that are uh, manifiestos of the Zapatistas and also some writings of the Flores Magón, who for me, the Zapatistas and the Flores Magón are the, like the core of what was the Mexican Revolution or what should have been the Mexican Revolution, but it wasn't. And in that sense, I perhaps I'm lucky enough to have a, a, a series of texts that because they didn't become uh, the triumphant revolution, it remain all, all as theoretical texts of possibilities yet to come, perhaps. Uh, but uh, while I do this, I would like you for, for you to keep in mind, please, if, uh, that what I'm talking about is mostly peasant rebellions. No? Oh, oh, even the Mexican Revolution can be considered in many ways an agrarian revolution. And that, as we know, um, agrarian revolutions have always been considered lacking. You know, their, their, they, their political aims are not national, they don't have a real political plan, a global plan, and they are always defeated. 
So, and that be precisely because of that, people, I hope, Baum, Baum um, Scott, William Taylor, for the case of Mexico, have said that it's, if one wants to find rebellion, true rebellion, and um, among peasants, one should look at daily life more so than a, a, a real break. And I, I was thinking uh, on what Juan and, and Macarena presented in their papers about this imminent critique uh, or, or, or a series of anti-primitive, counter-primitive accumulation moves. And, and that could be then one way to understand peasant daily life, you know? Um, and and the, the book that I wrote on Jesuits in the, 19th, in the 18th century in Mexico, it, it's arguing something like this, that it, it was easier to be against the colonial regime by remaining inside the colonial regime. What does that mean? Perhaps nothing at all, no? That to have a rebellion. And that once you have a rebellion, perhaps um, it, it's a continuity with life. So if we remember that, the two paradigms, that you can have um, um, life and rebellion being a continuity, or that on the other hand, you can have a break. No, that would be a revolution, as, as um, Andrade was saying. A revolution, in a way, implies a complete break with the system that was before. So what, what is it that we're talking about? And, and so uh, to keep, for, for you to keep that in mind, and also uh, the question of naming. Now, what, what, what do we mean when we say a revolution? What do we mean when we say uprising? And, and it's not only what we mean or not take it for granted, but also to let, us, uh, let the people who participated on, on those events tell us what they mean. And also what some really hostile witnesses say about what they're seeing in, in those movements. And, and the first thing that I will address, uh, one of those hostile witnesses is Carlos de Siguenza y Góngora, who, as I said, um, he wrote the report, the letter explaining the corn riot of 1692. Uh, and it's a beautiful text because he's so angry at what he sees. No, it's a fear. He's furious at what, um, what he sees. And, uh, and the name of the text, I, uh, I was talking about names and I forgot the name. The name is uh, Alboroto y Motín, which is uh, Alboroto means... What's Alboroto? Juan, help me. <laughs> a, a, riot, a, a riot, a riot, a riot, a riot, a riot. disorder. But it also means, in the Arabic, it also means, it, it's festive. No, it's Alboroto, it's like a party. So it's like having the two senses in, in what he's writing about, no, el alboroto, and, and it's precisely what he's, what he's telling us. And the structure of the text is very interesting because he, he is um, um, writing about the triumphs of the viceroy in turn, and that's what, that's what he calls them, you know, the defeat of pirates in the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean, and the defeat of uh, savage Indians in the borderlands. And little by little, he's, he's approaching Mexico City, and there things start to go really bad. You know? Because of heavy rains, the wheat is destroyed, and, and the Spaniards start to eat the corn that they didn't used to eat. And because of that, there's a shortage, shortage of corn, and there's hunger, um, and then the rebellion. And uh, so, <laughs> and, and, and the, re the rebellion, what I, I like, it's, it's very noisy. You know? He uses words as, uh, and it's not as if they, there's a crescendo, no, it's, it's noise here and there. It's discontinuous. But he, he, the pages in that book, and those are the pages that are absolutely beautiful, is, is rumors, whispers, conversations, words never heard of before, curses, swearing, cries, shouts, rocket, uproar. No, he, it's all this noise that, um, that is the rebellion. And... Uh, and not only, not only the, the noise, but the uh, adjectives that he's using to refer to them, and, and they're like shameless, insolent, out of tune, out of place, no? So that is precisely what an, uh, uh, an uprising is, no? Uh, getting out of place and, and, not, uh, and making noise, but are they making noise? I mean, that, because that one of the questions that Siguen uh, Sigongor is asking himself, though he's not really asking the question, is that uh, who, what's legitimate? And of course, for him, the riot is illegitimate. That's what they're shameless, ignorant, insolent, etc. But on the other hand, uh, the, the authorities there he's trying to save in this report are the ones that are completely absent in the text because they never show up to talk to the people. But uh, uh, to me, what is interesting also about this, what is legitimate, what is not, where is the noise, who's the one making noise, which is to say making no sense. 
Um, and it's, it's that the fact that when he's looking for causes of this, the, what caused the riot? Is it a natural phenomena that you have something good and then something bad happens? Mm -hmm. Or is it a God's punishment? This is the 17th century, so this could be an explanation. Um, and, or is it bad government? He leaves plenty of indications that it's that. But he uses something else. Uh, he says that it's the Indians remembering the conquest, that no matter what happens, it's the re so an, an anti-imperial of sorts. And, uh, and we don't know if it's true, because that's what he says that people were saying, but no other report mentions it. So it must, might be he's just his anxiety. <coughs> But whether it is or not, what I, I, I like this point because it tells us that even if this uprising was an uprising that could have been considered as one in which people were arguing it, it's a continuation of, of the same life, no? that let, let's bring back the order that, that was there before, the shortage of food. At the same time, the fact that he brings in the, the conquest, it already points out to... Um, that there's a possibility of another order. See, that is to say that, that, the, that the idea of the conquest take, takes us to dismantle the idea of the colonial as a kernel, as, as a seed of possibilities for something else, that whether it's going back to a pre-Hispanic, I don't know, but that there's another order there in the horizon. So and I'll, I'll leave that. Uh, this is the 1692 um, riot, and then I'll go to the documents from the Mexican Revolution, the Zapatista documents and the Flores Magón, which, um, uh, and I'll just address this very, very briefly to also connect it to the picture that perhaps you saw in the post, that um, the Zapatistas and Ricardo Flores Magón, they wanted very much to completely change society. The, the revolution was a complete change of society. And, and some people have argued that the Mexican Revolution was fought in order not to change. And, but uh, someone like Arturo Warman uh, has proven, even though he changed his mind later on, but I don't care, I still <laughs> we stay with the first Arturo Warman. He said that, no, the opposite, that the Zapatistas are absolutely modern to the extent that they were imagining a, a, a change in the global, a, a global change. All of society was going to change in the uh, factories, agricultural communities. And for the Flores Magón, who uh, would agree with this, it was, um, and I say the Flores Magón because there were several brothers, uh, though the main one is Ricardo Flores Magón, but uh, they, they were, uh, the change would also affect even something like the house, not the relationship between men and women. Uh, so it was a complete change in society, but here, and I'll connect this with uh, Siwense Gongora, for them, what made revolution possible is not politics. That is to say, and, and they say very clearly, both the Zapatistas and the Flores Magón, it's the economy. That is to say, you no, there's no revolution, there's no politics that has any validity for us, it's meaningless, if it's not the economy. That's why um, agrarian reform was fundamental. And, and, and also uh, because it, it, it was the most basic um, premise, the principle that would allow real autonomy. And without that, they're saying, you can keep your politics for yourself, we don't care about them. So there's a beautiful moment in, in, in both in Flores Magón and, and in the Zapatistas where they, all this noise, the blah, they don't say it like this, blah, 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 but they're almost saying that that blah, blah, the noise that was, what for Carlos de Siguenza y Gongora was the riot, for them is the politicians talking about freedom of the press and blah, 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 blah. It's like, no. First the economy, and then we can talk from that, from that land, the possibility of, of being autonomous and, and land tenure, then everything else should be built from that. Otherwise, it's meaningless. And I don't think I have time, but I w do I have? You have a, oh, another minute. One actually. minute, okay. So, and so I, I, I like to close with um, <clears throat> with a metaphor. And again, I, I apologize him in literature. As, as so, and I know we don't live by metaphors because um, real life has consequences, and people end up dying. But uh, that um, 
there's this book by uh, a Mexican novelist, uh, Nelly Campobello, the name of the book is Cartucho, and there's all of these series of vignettes of the Mexican Revolution. And, uh, and they're great, and I'd like to end with that because in, 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 in her book, like at least 50% of the vignettes end up in a man or s several men dead, dead men. So that's what we end up with. <laughs> but since she's not working in a chronological way, uh, the, a man that we saw dead is alive three pages later or 10 pages later. So a man is never really dead. They continue to be on, 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 and on in the book. And the last vignette in the book, it's, it's, uh, it, she ends, she closes the book with um, a general defeat of the, um, the Carrancistas by the Villistas, no? but, but uh, that is to say by the true revolutionaries. And, and, and in fact, she has several vignettes about Pablo Lopez, whose picture I posted on, on the web. So, um, it, it, and what I love about this book is that she shows in fiction what a, a historian like Adolfo Gili, who for me is the main, uh, the most important um, um, historian of the Mexican Revolution, what he calls his book is the, uh, La Revolución Interrumpida, The Interrupted Revolution. And in, in a way, this fiction works in the same way because we see men still fighting and alive, you no, know, waiting for the moment to, the revolution to start again. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Terrific. Yeah, no, and, and actually really perfectly on point because of the movement from this notion of kind of reacting against the conquest in an anti-imperialist way and moving towards <clears throat> notions of autonomia, um, particularly uh, in terms of agricultural redistribution, et cetera. So um, very helpful. Thanks. Um, Juan? Thank you. Um, I, I posted something on the page for the seminar so I'm not going to refer to that, but to a few points that are part of the ongoing research project from which that blog post um, came out. Um, so of the three terms that were posited to us, uh, anti-imperialism, autonomy, and self-determination, uh, I want to focus on autonomy now, although, of course, uh, as my colleagues here have been pointing out the three or four are absolutely connected. Uh, and I guess the main question or point that I did include in the, in the blog post that guides some of this ongoing research project is uh, what is the possibility for uh, the emergence of an alternative political economic system, uh, an alternative to capital, to capitalism, in a moment when uh, the horizon of revolution seems to have been cancelled uh, for the most part. Uh, we have insurgency and uprisings throughout the world, but the, the paradigm of revolution has, for the most part, uh, vanished. So what we encounter are um, imminent resistances to capital. And, uh, and, and that is the point of departure for my, for my current uh, thinking how can an alternative or a radical alternative emerge from within. Uh, and there the, the question of autonomy becomes central because various kinds of uh, spaces of resistance are being opened up uh, throughout the world. Very, very different textual spaces and different kinds of spaces, particularly if they happen in the global north or in the global south. Um, and they do present uh, alternative or embryonic alternative forms uh, of social relations, of economic relations, of, of political organization. And yet, uh, of course, on the one hand, they don't produce a full alternative to the dominant hegemonic systems that we endure. Uh, on the other hand, I don't know if they are positing such a radical alternative or they are just positing an interruption. And there are some of the examples that I mentioned in the, in the blog post come from uh, social movements in various regions of the world, but mostly in Latin America, movements that precisely have to do with occupation and interruption. And um, another point connected to that is that we all know that most of these uh, movements and 
moments of insurgency have to do with the occupation of space. But in my project, I'm very interested in how this also represents an occupation of time. And, um, and certainly an interruption of time, a circulation of, of time. And uh, the inhabiting of an alternative temporality. The, the occupation of a hegemonic temporality, the opening up of temporalities that are alternative to the temporality of capital. And we, that is a big claim. We can discuss that uh, uh, in, in, our, in our conversation. So the two connected um, concepts of occupation, uh, we have witnessed, and Bernard has worked on this uh, very much in the last few years, uh, we have witnessed several mo movements and moments of occupation throughout the world. I don't think they can be subsumed under the same paradigm, under the same view, from, from the Arab Spring, uh, the occupation of squares, to the Argentinian uprisings to occupy Wall Street that then disseminated throughout the US and so on. There is certainly a common element of assembly and occupation, but I don't think we can fully subsume uh, those, uh, not to mention that they were all subsumed under the label of occupation after uh, Occupy Wall Street became a global paradigm. So, you know, the global north again uh, exporting this uh, term and this label when these are very, very different textures and moments of the political throughout the world. The, the problem of anti imperialism or imperialism. Um, as, I, as I see it, I would like to emphasize right now one uh, main aspect. Without fully endorsing today, I used to endorse it, but without fully endorsing the, the Tony Negri or Hartan Negri view of empire, we have to certainly acknowledge that we are in a, in a very, very different, if, if not absolutely different time of capital and configuration of capital that today is... Um, hegemonized by finance, by financial capital. That puts the question of, forget uh, if it's empire with capital E or, or not, but it puts the question of colonialism and imperialism in a very, very different political and economic uh, space. A space of fragmentation, of multipolarity, a space at least that I would argue for the sake of our conversation is absolutely different from the high uh, the heyday of, of European empires that were very much shaped by the, the, the moment of industrial capitalism. Uh, to speak of empire or imperialism since the late 60s, 70s, and today in an era hegemonized by finance, I think it requires a, a different vocabulary, a different set of uh, hermeneutic uh, tools. And there, I would stay for a moment with the problem of capital. You have to stop me because I don't know how, for how long I've been talking. Uh, the moment, the, the problem of capital, if, um, again, our problem today until recently has been that of absolute real subsumption of capital, absolutely hegemonizing uh, in different ways and, and through uneven development, but we can agree that the logic of commodification and capital has hegemonized the world for the most part. What we are witnessing today as various crises of capital throughout the world is a new wave of, yes, primitive accumulation, but fundamentally of the return of formal subsumption, of, of capital retreating, of capital uh, withdrawing and opening up new spaces there where everything had been apparently uh, closed, closed down. So there we have two, and that is the other concept I want to emphasize today and in my research, the concept of the open, two sorts of opening, formal subsumption from the platform economy to new forms of, of uh, appropriation of land and territory in the global south. Capital is opening up new enclaves and new spaces and resistance to capital is opening up spaces of interruption, um, spaces that are imminent critiques. But as I said before, just to tie that to the, to the beginning of my presentation, are not yet presenting a full alternative or a radical 
the emergence of a radical paradigm as used to be the case with anti-imperialist movements from Latin America to Africa, which are two cases of which I know a little bit. Uh, let me say two things about uh, autonomy uh, that I think are fundamental in the genealogy of today's movements of autonomy. One is the European background and the other one, the, the Latin American background. The European, the, from the 60s, 70s, the Italian and the French, also later the German uh, autonomous movements, what I think they fundamentally bring to the discussion today uh, is the acknowledgement of the um, generalization of the paradigm of labor and um, of a new conf bi biopolitical configuration of capital. As, as we all know, Italian autonomy movements, uh, autonomy Marxism brought uh, to the table, to the discussion, the question of living labor, of labor outside of the factory, of labor in a moment of real, absolute real subsumption as uh, living labor that encompasses many, many other forms of non-waged labor, where labor and life, the temporality of labor and the time of life are not easily distinguished anymore, are absolutely blurred. I think that is a fundamental point for us to discuss autonomy today in a biopolitical setting. And from the Latin American background or genealogy of autonomy from, from the anti-imperialist movements to the to the neo, the neo zapatista movement, but also the landless movement uh, of Semterra in Brazil, uh, the question of certainly of space and autonomous territory, but very much so the question of time and temporality uh, that the Zapatistas emphasized time uh, and again the question of autonomous times. Now, having said that. As, as a caveat or, or a side point, um, I just wrote down this as I heard my two comrades here presenting. Um, colonialism and, and imperialism already uh, demarcated zones of autonomy for the subject populations, for colonized subject populations. So we also encounter that conundrum or that paradox that where autonomy is a sign of insurgency and uprises. We have to be very much aware and conscious that imperial politics and colonial dynamics always already allowed for spaces of autonomy, as we just heard in the case of land tenure in Mexico, certainly of customary forms of the political and the economy in the case of colonial Africa, and so on. Autonomy also uh, positives questions related to self-possession, self-determination, and self-defense. Uh, this would be a long discussion, but I would like to just put that on the table. To what extent these concepts have a, a liberal genealogy, a liberal background, and they can be turned, overtaken and overturned into a non-liberal or socialist, certainly Marxist, anarchist type of uh, project but acknowledging that they have a strong uh, overdetermined origin in, in liberal uh, conceptions of community and of the self, of the citizen, in terms of autonomy and freedom. Maybe that's, a, that's an original curse that is not very easily to, to release oneself uh, from. Uh, let, me, let me conclude with a couple of final points. Um, the, the curse, the blessing and the curse, or the beauty and the beast here in terms of, of autonomy. We witness the emergence and the unfolding of autonomous movements throughout the world, from Mexico to the examples that I'm not going to elaborate now in Argentina, in Brazil, that I posted on the blog, to the Kurdish freedom movement in Turkey and Syria, to forms of urban autonomous movements, uh, most particularly I've been reading about Athens uh, and new forms of political and economic 
organization. Of course, the problem is the fragmentation of these movements. Many of them are very short-lived because within this new configuration of capital, of uh, new forms of formal subsumption, withdrawal and reappropriation by capital, uh, the problem of articulation between and among these various movements uh, is very, very complicated, if not impossible, if one believes that articulation is, as I do, fundamental in order to take these uh, communes and communities to, to a next level or to a next step in which they can actually bring to fruition uh, that promise of autonomy. Let me uh, conclude with the other form of autonomous movement that we have been discussing in the last few years, questions of occupation and assembly. And there we have, again, um, interruptions, moments of effervescence and, and emergence, but mostly interruptions of circulation, interruptions of space. Certainly, I want to emphasize interruptions of time. To what extent, just to belabor the point, those movements of interruption can lead to uh, maybe not a radical alternative paradigm, but to a next level, to a next step uh, in which they are not just that uh, effervescent moment. Point in case, of course, uh, not just Occupy here in the US, but the Arab Spring, uh, the, the short-lived promise and, and defeat of the movements across that a region that we can discuss because it's over over determined. I would like to say as a provocation that these movements of, of occupation and assembly uh, produce a, if we can speak with that language here, a me metaphysics of presence. They focus the attention and the practice on the question of the bodies on the square, bodies on on public square, that metaphysics of appearance, whereas we all know very well that the political lies elsewhere, um, lies beyond and before that moment of effervescence and appearance, I think uh, both the logic of finance, the logic of uh, digitalization in which these politics unfold, um, carry in themselves the contradiction that brings down very quickly these moments of, of effervescence, because the political is a, a previous depth of texture, of long-term practice and organization and construction that leads to that moment of effervescence, whereas now we are being enthralled and um, enchanted and mesmerized by the question of assembly and of the bodies uh, assembled in the square. So let me quickly run down the four main points that I wanted to make. Alternative logics uh, or alternative systems, uh, radical alternative, can they emerge from within, from imminent moments of interruption? Um, the question of time and temporality. Third, the question of the open. Capital is opening up new spaces, but also resistance on the ground is opening up new spaces. Sometimes they, they coincide, they overlap. And finally, to conclude, to what extent the question of autonomy certainly brings up, opens up again the question of popular sovereignty, uh, the question of where lies uh, sovereignty today, which new configurations of the people or populism, more, more centrally the question of autonomy as a question of popular sovereignty. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, yeah, so lots of interesting questions, particularly about um, kind of the intangible nature of the financialized capitalism and of the digital context within which kind of then anti-imperialism becomes something very different, right? Good, okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Magdalena? So thank you for having me here, Bernard, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, it's an honor to be amongst the panelists, and what I'll try to do is just comment on some of the things that have been pointed out, bring my own discussions and kind of viewpoints into it, 
not necessarily bring the blog forward because you can look at the blog online, but then maybe ask a question of each of you, if that's okay. So I really want to build on um, the presentations and really think about the alternatives and uh, in relationship to memories of revolution and really kind of lift the idea of memory um, again. And in particular, my comments are based on research on new forms of authoritarianism. And I think we have to remember that authoritarianism has shifted, it's expanded, it's changing, and it's reconfigured itself, and also a kind of expanding global criminalization. Um, more and more populations are being incorporated and in, criminalized in, throughout the world, and certainly in the hemisphere, um, and there's a lot to be learned from kind of U.S. and Latin American comparisons in that way. But especially my own work is on indigenous territories of extraction, so what does it look like to criminalize native peoples, and what can we learn from those experiences? And to kind of foreground Ruthie Gilmore's always prescient question, what is to be done in these conditions? So in his post, Juan asks about, um, quote, how is resistance to capital possible if any movement of interruption or contestation is at present imminent to the logic of capital? And he continues, where can resistance be located if all life worlds have been appropriated and subsumed by capital? And I think that's a really important set of questions, but I'd also say that part of the logic and empirical uh, examples that Juan brought forward from the Piquiteros movements in the aftermath of the Argentine peso crisis um, point exactly to the fact that life worlds have not been completely subsumed into capital. And I think I want to pause upon this point and really elaborate upon it um, in the ways in which I think you were doing in the presentation. And I think here we have to think with theories about and experiences by black and indigenous lives, and I'm happy to cite and, and think about this work if people are interested, but from my own grounded experience in extractive zones, I've learned that really capitalist logics indeed cannot appropriate all of life. There's a narrow path of refusal and resistance between life and death in these necropolitical spaces, um, but there are escape valves uh, that we, ha we might follow in order not to reinscribe the totalizing discourses of the global economy, right? There's a way in which by our very narratives and languaging we're reproducing the thing that is supposedly inscribing us within it constantly. So I would just say and argue that it's just not true that we're all inserted into the global economy. Um, and of course, it's also true that the Americas were never fully colonized. And so spatial logics really assume that kind of extractive view, I would call it, of total domination. And I think we have to find ways of thinking about chronotopes or of differentiated um, spatialized power, uh, but also kind of, uh, kind of work in the vein of constant negation, right? Um, not only critique on the other side of the colonial divide, as we were talking about last night in a separate discussion, but also kind of think about what that, what that looks like to constantly negate and refuse that we've all been incorporated. And this is a point that I really follow and build upon in the work of Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, um, the Aymara scholar from Bolivia, who uh, makes much of this idea of the horizon and drawing upon certain kinds of Aymara and Dian traditions to not think about revolution as linear or the temporalities, right, of a kind of certain stages of, and models, um, or even to think about it as episodic. So when we get in the language of episodic, we're still within a normative time flow, I would suggest. But instead, consider permanent insurrection as cyclical and continual. And that idea of permanent insurrection to me has been really helpful in terms of a methodology to kind mm -hmm. of sort out and think through um, what I'm you know, comparing to the black radical tradition as an Andean radical tradition. And I think it's really important to think about what that different kind of model would look like. Um, so for me, I did start with a kind of situation of the neo-colonial, neo-imperial um, land grabs in the global economy, and I looked at five comparative regions in, in my book. And what I instead, uh, when I started, the, you know, my, my question, it was, what were the alternatives? And instead, I kind of came upon what can we learn from those that are living on the other side of catastrophe? So what do we have to raise from the fact that for many people, right, the apocalypse has already come? So for me, I've been investigating spaces of consumer capitalism 
in gentrification, and of course gentrification can happen in rural and urban spaces, um, and also that have been appropriative of the logics of indigenous cultures in hyper-neoliberal capitalist places. And here I would highlight um, you know, places of spiritual tourism, places of tourism in general, places where it's hard to get at whatever authenticity is operative there. Um, but I think it's also important to understand the extent of some of this destruction, right? Uh, I talk about the 22 recent dams that run along the Madalena River in southwestern uh, Cauca region in Colombia. I talk about the eucalyptus and pine cultivation in those forests in southern Chile that have dispossessed Mapuche peoples. And to consider that the colonial wars are ongoing. It's not as if those ended, right, in a certain periodization that's convenient for no, a certain kind of notion of history or disciplinarity, but in fact are kind of ongoing processes. Um, the kind of long extraction or the long view of that by national and multinational petroleum corporations, um, and here I'm thinking especially of eastern Ecuador, um, that, of course, since Chevron's discovery of oil, have produced really massive, devastating uh, conditions. But I'm also more generally thinking of the kind of new mega extractivisms in Guatemala, Panama, and throughout the Global South, really, um, in addition to new pipelines, fracking, open air mining, overfishing of the seas. And there's so much to say about this, but one of the things I concur, I think, with the previous panelists is that we do have to identify a kind of new new formation of, of capital and a kind of mega extractivism that's taking place that in prior times has operated on much smaller scale and now has much larger coordinations of multipolarity, um, multinational actors, uh, you know, and, and very, very coordinated efforts. So um, to me, I think to consider a lot of these spaces, we do need to sort through new histories of revolution, new contexts of extractivism, rewriting potentially some of the Cold War histories that we've been told about what guerrilla insurgents looked like and what those forms of imperialism were and potentially bring forward the issue of the land grab and territory um, in terms of the kind of expanding ways we think about planetary differentiation, right, or uh, territories of difference to kind of quote um, Arturo Escobar on that point. Um, and also just to think a little bit about what we can learn from U.S. indigenous studies and obviously a comparative hemispheric moment about what it means to decolonize. And I think we're in a moment where everywhere you go with an activist in radical communities is decolonize, right? Decolonize this, decolonize water, decolonize that. But what do we really mean by using that language and I think some of U.S. Native Studies has been instructive that we have to consider land occupation in relationship to indigenous peoples um, and questions of sovereignty, not only in terms of liberal Western democracies, but in relationship to indigenous nations. Um, so I think in, in my own retelling, I'm trying to rethink a lot about what it meant to spray Andean crops, right, during the U.S. war on drugs, or what it meant in terms of, um, you know, the Colombian democratic security campaigns and the ways in which the military spread during Arube. And so how to think about neoliberalism differently in the it opened new avenues for certain forms of militarisms and for what maybe we could call extractive governmentality. Um, and this has been, of course, a violent process of separating communities from their means of production, as you were referring to in relationship to rural communities. The other thing I want to say is that we might lift in these, uh, in not totalizing the global economy, um, the literature on social reproduction, which I think is really important, and to kind of rethink Marxist feminisms in this moment um, given that 80% of laborers worldwide are located not within formal economies, but in the interstices of the global economy, right? So what does it mean actually to think about the formal economy anew? Um, and this leads me to think not only about the histories of resistance that we tell and, you know, that are often masculinist, but to retell histories through the perspective of women, children, 
um, other kinds of subaltern populations, precisely because if you think of a mining community, it's often homosocial and masculine, but it's in the slag pile, right, the million wa um, waste pile, it's women and children who are doing that work in those spaces. So what, what might we say about that? And here, I mean, Saskia Sasson's work on expulsions is important. There are other ways to think about it, but certainly we also have to consider these forced global migrations in, in this moment to kind of even begin to rethink revolution, right? So there's a kind of whole set of concerns that I'm interested in putting on the table that allow us to maybe think about revolution um, differently. So I think for me, one thing that emerges is that uh, in the way we're talking about autonomy today, I guess I have a question about whether that's replacing the terminology that we've used often in the Medicas as liberation. And, you know, um, part of this comes out of the discussion that the new state socialisms of Latin America have foregrounded, and I, I talk about in the post, and basically mm -hmm. the kind of question of what does national sovereignty mean precisely in this acute intensification moment of the global economy and of the rise of certain forms of criminalization, militarization, et cetera. And one thing I make a lot of um, in my own work is the fact that though a lot of us had newfound hope in these pink tide states, we found that in fact, right, that um, <coughs> they only expanded privatization, deregulation, mega extractivism, new contracts with China, new avenues. Um, so there's really been a, a kind of shift there and that's something we really have to consider. There was a lot of celebration maybe 10 years back for the rise of the BRICS, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, South Africa, but maybe we might kind of temper that, that in, in the aftermath of the pink tide governments. So I'll say more about that in a second. Um, so for me, I'm really interested instead now in kind of foregrounding artistic and political undercurrents. And, you know, the work of Fred Moten has been really, in, and Stefano Harney and the undercommons is really important to me because it starts from the position of debt, something, of course, in the global south we know a lot about. Um, and so what does it mean to kind of start from that position and work in the undercurrents, right, against the, the pink tide, if you will, or underneath it? And for me, these are kind of dissident spaces of social mm -hmm. interaction, um, translocal spaces, and here I would just lift the work of um, Sonia Alvarez and Claudia, Claudia de Lima Costa, and they refer to this as translocalidades, or translocalities, which I think is a really interesting way of mm -hmm. thinking about Blau, uh, brown, black solidarities, transits between South, North, and the Caribbean, or middle spaces in the Americas um, in a kind of cross-current flow of political activity. So I'm, I love that idea of the translocality because it comes out of spaces of solidarity um, where there's really vibrant social interaction and ways of um, you know, transferring embodied knowledge. That really, to me, is one of the ways we think can think about political futures, okay? So it has to be in that space of embodiment. So let me end just by making a couple of points or three points and then asking some questions. Um, the first is how we might write back in race and gender and sexuality in our own discussion here and as capital intensifies. And I'm interested precisely because I know, right, there's uh, hunger strikes, land reoccupations in this moment, student social movements, um, and embodied art and performance, and these become really important forms of refusal um, that I guess in some ways are not necessarily outside of power structures, but are certainly changing the forms of affect, affiliation, solidarities within. So, um, and often led by indigenous women, queer of color youth, black activists, mothers and students, and are at the forefront of what, I, uh, Jose Quiroga calls queering the nation, right? Because in a lot of our discussions of revolution, somehow we're still foregrounding the nation state um, and not necessarily noting that it has its own heteronormative dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the second point I'd make is that in some ways, when we have these discussions of kind of political theory in relationship to revolution, we treat representation and mediated expressions um, as kind of epiphenomenal rather than central to the project of radical transformation. And I would just think that given the fracturing 
uh, the social media context, public-private divides are fractured, et cetera. The increased global circuits for independent media, which I think has been really important to learning about each other's uh, movements, that we might find new, new archives and new citations that consider that. Um, and then finally, I just want to lift Yvonne's really poignant uh, blog that is, you know, <coughs> really trying to get us to think about submerged memories um, or the kind of radical archive of submerged memories. And, you know, this has uh, overlaps with Idea Hartman's work, with Marie, uh, Marianne Hirsch's work that allows us to kind of, I think, disavow the illusion of democracy or of you know, deepening radical democracy that was kind of um, on the table again about 10 or 15 years ago, that maybe we might think beyond that some of that work. And um, to me, some of that work is being done by artists who get us to think about submerged histories or uh, kind of weave new webs of complicity in our own consumer practices or, I guess, you know, to locate other kinds of logics um, of collusion with capital. and potentially to find new routes outside of, I guess, what I'm calling the extractive zone. So um, that's just in terms of my comments, uh, but I do have a couple of things to say about the presentations, which I found really interesting and really b built in important ways on each other and also in relationship to, um, to what's online. So um, in, in Andrew's representation, if I may um, call you Andrew, um, one of the things I was really interested in is this comparison between Eastern Europe and South Africa. And, um, you know, I tried not to hear the kind of stages of progression potentially there, but I think I want to ask you about if you could say more about the temporality of the broad protections you were outlining at the end. Um, and in particular, just interesting to note that, you know, Argentina, Mexico, Chile, I mean, may, many places in Latin America followed South Africa example on like um, LGBT and same-sex marriage. And in many ways, it wasn't an index of a more open society necessarily, but a more neoliberal one, right? So what are the ways maybe that we can think about that in different ways of some of the ways in which rights there do a particular kind of, of work um, in that case? And then Yvonne, I really loved what you started with, this idea um, of Zapatismo and the Mexican Revolution and the kind of uh, ways in which there's, you know, foreground, what would it have meant to foreground Flores Magón in the Mexican Revolution? And I'm just wondering if you could say more about that because to me some of that work is, you know, um, is, is definitely anarchistic, right? It's about an anti-state revolution. So what does it mean to put that forward and what would that do to rewrite the history of the, um, maybe it couldn't be rewritten through the Flores Magón brothers, I don't know. But certainly their kind of transnational ties to other anarchist movements would be a really interesting way to, I think, rethink, uh, you know, I mean, maybe we would never be at the point where the Hedo system was repealed or, you know, neoliberalism in that particular format, right? So I'm just asking you to, to ponder that. Maybe it's romantic of me, but I'm, I'm, I am interested in that question that you put forward. Um, and then finally to Juan, I love what you were talking about in relationship to kind of the biopolitical configuration of capitalism. And I was thinking about my colleague's work, um, the political theorist Johanna Oksala, and she talks about the biopolitical configuration of capitalism, but she does it and sorts through it through biocapitalism and surrogate bodies, right? And the transfers that happen, you know, by European women going to spaces like India and other places and um, mm -hmm. occupying, to use your language, right, the body of another in order to be able to reproduce. And so I'm just trying to think of other like again, how we can potentially think about gender and sex in this kind of discussion of occupation and what does it do and change our radical paradigms. Um, and then finally, Juan, you know, I think you'd have a lot to say to us about, um, because you do work on Africa and South America and a lot in you know, the global south, um, what can you say about the present rise of the global right 
<laughs> and what we do with that. Small question. All right, that's it. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. And, uh, and thank you also for your post, which developed, um, with the, which was so rich and develops kind of a whole other uh, conversation that we can have at the table about transformations in the past 20 years. Um, so uh, here's what I think, here's what I think. I think I, I'd like to throw out one kind of unifying question um, and then maybe open it a little bit to just a few comments and then we can come back to the panel to get some responses both to Macarena's mine and maybe a few other questions if there are some to kind of start the conversation. And I mean, I'll be brief because in part I think um, I was um, weaving some of this in the, in the interstices of the uh, talks. But I mean, what I, what I sense as I listened to your uh, really fascinating interventions is that um, it's, it's possible that one can look at the notion of anti-imperialism as being somewhat um, dated um, and, um, and, and related to certain political contexts that have changed dramatically, right? And, and so, Juan, you were talking a lot about the changes in, in just advanced capitalism, forms of capitalism, financialization, digitalization today. Um, Yvonne, you were talking about the transformations towards kind of agricultural autonomy and um, and um, and 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 uh, and so one might have a tendency or might might want to replace that term with something else. But I what I'm concerned about is what we lose when we uh, get rid of that term. Uh, and that was a little bit the the question that I wanted you, uh, Andrew, to develop a little bit more, and you spoke about it very briefly in the Cuban context, but still, like, what is it that you lose? And I think one of the things you lose, and I, I heard it in Macarena's, is this, is the, the extractive, which the extractive to me has a more kind of, it ties more to the imperialism, I feel. Maybe I'm wrong, and you know, so, I, you know, I'd be interested in think, in hearing what you th what you think, Macarena. But this notion of kind of extracting from uh, these countries um, uh, through you know petrol or 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 or, or whatever resources are being taken um, mm -hmm. brings us back, it seems to me, to the older notions of anti-imperialism that that um, that we think might not be so uh, relevant, but actually. Uh, are so profoundly there and remain there. Uh, so, so the question would be, um, if we move away too much from that term and from that concept and what goes with it, like, are we missing uh, what's really going on uh, in so many of these countries? Um, and are, are, are we, and it's, it's a question ultimately of, you know, um, how much, how, how, how much of reality are we explaining, right? Um, uh, which is the, the usual, you know, I mean, it can, be, it can be stated in any number of ways, right? There's a, there's a social scientific way to explain it, but, but I mean, the idea is, you know, if you're focusing on some, some smaller bore land reform issues or something, uh, or, or a form of occupation maybe uh, that's, you know, are, are you missing though, you know, what's really going on? Or so more of an explanation of the, of the real forces at play that have to do with, you know, I'm, I'm not sure which, which are the corporations and the multinationals and the, and, the, um, and the political and geopolitical interests that are at play in the space. And we had touched upon this a little bit in the Arab Spring context because, um, because we had uh, Tariq Ali's intervention, which was a very classically anti-imperialist intervention in that context, and, he, and what he was trying to remind us was, you know, you can, you can talk about all these little things and whatnot, but just remember that the geopolitics in this region are so dominant that if you're not focused on that, you're, you're 
you're kind of missing the ball game or something like that. So that would be that would be the kind of theme that I would be interested in. But before we come back to the panelists, I mean, I'm sure there are many who would like to jump in. So why don't we try to take three, say, three comments. Um, and um, why don't you introduce yourselves also so that the panelists know who you are. Hari. Uh, thank you, everyone, for speaking with us. Uh, I'm Hadis Dodani. I'm a JD student uh, in the law school. Um, I wanted to ask if any of you could speak further to the intersection or mutual constitutiveness of domestic problems of justice and international questions of imperialism. Uh, and I think there are various ways to approach this. If I may refer to just two very brief uh, examples to illustrate what I mean. Uh, the first would be, uh, I think Black Panther uh, would be an interesting, the film might be an interesting way to look at this in many ways. It is, you know, very much in the uh, discourse of Black Lives Matter uh, and yet, as Kimberly Crenshaw and Hamid Dabashi have written, in many ways, in ways it also fails to really grapple with the problem of uh, black liberation and anti-imperialism. Uh, the, the ending sort of takes a very reductionist law and development approach to, to the, the anti-imperial questions and black liberation in the U.S. Uh, and another case study would be, that's in a completely di different area, would be to look at Brazil. I think what's really interesting about Brazil is, at least in the international and law of the sea and space law, they've taken a very like anti-imperial, uh, new international economic order uh, approach to the principle of the common heritage of mankind. Uh, and yet within Brazil, uh, it's very much the opposite in many respects, um, where, for example, its space program and its space ports have sort of operated against the interests of indigenous, black, and poor people within Brazil. Uh, so I'm just curious, in these different contexts and different parts of the world, how do we reconcile these international questions about imperialism and these domestic problems of injustice? Thank you. Thank you, Haris. Um, let's see, who else wants in? What? Yes? Okay. Uh, hi. Fa yeah, Fadi Bardawil. I teach at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, I would like to sort of continue on the thread that Bernard opened on the question of... Uh, anti-imperialism, because I think if one looks at the question of imperialism and anti-imperialism from the perspective of the Arab revolutions, what you get is a very, very uh, interesting perspective, which is the question of that we really do not have a political theoretical language to describe uh, what Russia is doing in Syria or what Iran is doing in Syria. It seems to me that whether... Uh, at least from the perspective of the Arab world. Again, if you agree with Bernard that imperialism has to do with extraction, anti-imperialism, anti which is the language of these regimes, especially the Syrian regime, for example, or the former Libyan regime, that the people basically revolted to overthrow, is something that cannot be understood but by a very simple opposition uh, to the West. So, so basically my question to you is, Maybe, I mean, I agree that anti-imperialism is outdated, but I think there's something here fundamentally theoretical about how uh, a lot of our critical languages are parasitic on a particular notion of the West, whether if you take, for example, the question of uh, Orientalism and, and Edward Said, or you take imperialism as uh, refusing the dictates of basically the U.S. in the area, which uh, renders, renders a lot of these struggles invisible, or uh, you fall back on the Tari Ali position that basically Bernard uh, talked about, which is basically uh, the emancipa emancipatory practices of these people on the ground are sort of foreclosed from the domain of the political or are be become epiphenomenal, mm -hmm. precisely because the geopolitics is what's taken to be fundamental in that area. And, uh, and that brings me you know, to your uh, very interesting comment about the BRICS, because if we look at the BRICS from the perspective of basically the Arab revolutions, it's the question of how do we understand what Russia is doing in the area? How do you understand what China is doing in the area? And I think there's uh, something here that, has, that basically our political, theoretical, critical languages uh, failed, failed to capture, failed to capture in, the, in these movements. That would be very interesting. Uh, for me to, uh, to hear what you would, uh, you would think about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fadi. Um, Behruz, uh, you need, just need to turn it on there, it, flip it up. Yeah, if you flip it up, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Behruz Kamari, I'm a professor of 
professor at the University of Illinois. Um, I want to go back to uh, the uh, more of a conceptual question about revolution, because in so many different ways, all of you touched upon this, but I want to go back to this sort of the basic uh, understanding, because in, uh, if I hear you correctly, uh, in different ways, you're sort of dismissing the possibility of revolutions. Um, um, dismissing, the possibility of revolutions. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, I agree with uh, Professor Rotter that that uh, 20th century did something to revolution in a sort of a Leninist way that it contained the possibilities of a revolution. It made revolutions something of a known uh, uh, commodity. That uh, whenever we hear the notion of revolution, we know what the end outcome already is. And, uh, and I like to go back to this kind of uh, Benjaminian understanding of, of revolution, that, that, uh, that when he talks about the Russian revolution, he says that it's a utopian leap in the open air of history. Mm -hmm. In a sense that I like that kind of understanding because it brings together the spatial and temporal um, uh, very nicely. Uh, that, uh, there's an element of unknown in, 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 in the whole notion of revolution. That uh, the Leninist sort of betrayal of the notion of re revolution is that it made that uh, element of unknown totally known. And, uh, and in that sense, it sort of contained the possibilities of revolution. In a sense, revolutions of 19th century, which was, again, that, that leap that nobody knew where these revolutions were uh, moving towards. The directionality of it, the, the temporality of it was totally ambiguous in that sense. That ambiguity d disappears from most of 20th century revolutions. And, uh, and in a sense, uh, revolutions from, again, the, the possible realities becomes real possibilities. That notion of eminence. Uh, is, I think, very much related to that, that we think of revolution or transformations as real possibilities, not possible realities. Uh, and I like that in, in your presentation, uh, uh, Yvonne, that, that you know, what is interesting about many of these agrarian revolutions is actually that they don't have a global project. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and they mostly operate through a negative dialectic. And, uh, and that openness, uh, I think, is the point of creativity and significance mm -hmm. in understanding revolutions. So in that sense, I think, you know, uh, going back to this, past, again, you know, I'm also guilty of thinking very romantically about revolutions. But, uh, and I'm here to claim that romanticism. I said that there is nothing wrong about that romantic understanding of revolution. I understand they have consequences. We saw those photos, very, very haunting photos. But I also want to sort of restore some sense of dignity to those photos. You know, that, that, uh, because then it, I think in, in so many different ways, uh, it's an unfair question to ask about revolutionaries, what is your alternative? You know, because you know, the point of revolution is to open up a space uh, for thinking about alternatives, thinking about possibilities. Um, so I stop there. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, romantic, but also realistic. You are. I mean, uh, given your history. Okay. So um, why don't we why don't we uh, ask okay. our panelists yeah. to kind of so so in a in machine gun like way. Uh, my argument was that we should uh, abandon the normative concept of revolution. Obviously, empirically, there will be revolutions. But I wanted to keep in a version anti-imperialism. I mean, that's the, the structure, but I, I, in shortness of time, I couldn't really present it uh, well enough. I mean, anti-imperialism, taking into account that now we are dealing with, I would say, heterogeneity of imperialisms, because there is this financial... Uh, yeah a purely economic thing which no longer involves occupying territories, but there is still, you know, occupation of Iraq was still an occupation, and there's lots of oil there. I'm not sure if that's the only reason for going, but, you know, uh, it was there, and everybody 
uh, knew it. So we have actually different kinds of imperialisms, uh, and I think anti-imperialism still, uh, to the extent that if you're talking about system change, uh, should be preserved. I mean, this Benjamin perspective, I find it very attractive, of course, uh, but look at his example. It's the Soviet Union, right? And now you say uh, Lenin betrayed it. Of course, to Trotsky, it's Stalin who betrayed it. Uh, there are people like to Mao, it was Rushchev who betrayed it. It's always being betrayed, but somehow it's just never really taken seriously that there is a con continuity and logic uh, in that kind of, that kind of process. Uh, so, so, yeah, you know, uh, can't, you know, Einstein defines madness as inability to really learn and to repeat exactly the same things that we have always done before. Uh, do we want to be mad in that sense? And I think after this, Islamic revolution, right? I mean, uncannily, same kind of logic in a very different setting with a different ideology. I mean, can't we really finally learn from, from all these experiences which are uncannily being repeated. And I think, luckily, people, maybe not so many people in the room, but there are people out there who really have learned because, you know, think of where the actors come from. The ANC is a communist party, right, originally, or at least a Marxist-Leninist uh, formation. Uh, this, the Spanish uh, Communist Party that participates in the process that I spoke to was also a communist party. And even East European communist parties, right, as they reconstruct themselves. So I think there are people out there who are, in fact, learning. Okay, so that's, that's the first uh, uh, point. The other point is, and I think it's a response to the rest of the panel, is that, of course, we're going to have forms of mobilization, autonomous forms of expression from below, occupations, utopian aspirations all over the place. But, I mean, anyone who kind of wants to look at uh, the world and history knows that these things, and Benjamin knew this very well, that's why he called them yes Satan. they are now times in a rupture of time, the real time is bad, but they're always these great times. Well, if you're satisfied with, and it's a very aesthetic perspective, I mean, I, uh, I, I don't really welcome so many uh, people from art and literature into uh, our subject area, not because they're not, uh, not because they're not very interesting people and they say interesting things, but to the extent, but, 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 but their perspective is always going to be this way, you know, for the sake of a beautiful moment, a beautiful experiment, let the rest of it, they don't care about the rest of it. I care about the rest. I care about the rest, what happens after and what happens in the process. And this moment is only a moment. I mean, look at Occupy Wall Street. What, I, what is the consequence of it? We got Trump now, right? Look at the autonomists in Spain. So you get Podemos. And Podemos is forced to enter into the same game as everybody else. Greece, Syriza. Uh, you know, Egypt, wonderful, the occupation, right? And what do you have? You have a battle between the, uh, the brothers and the military. Uh, that moment when actually the question of power... Lenin is right about this. The question of power is going to be posed. And you cannot pose it on the basis of, of ideas derived from art and aesthetics. You have to derive them from politics and political experience and political history. And, and I think we see that there is that moment when from civil society and, 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 and mobilization from below, one must make, take the step. One must take the step to political society and political life. And the question is, what form will that take? And I don't want it to take the Leninist form anymore. There are alternatives to it now. But it will take some kind of form, or the military comes back and takes it over, or the brothers come and take it over. Somebody going to have to deal with the question of power. It's, uh, what you guys are talking about puts power onto the street, but someone will have to take it up. It's always taken up. And you look at every single revolution in history, and it's always like this. It has to be taken up. Lenin is right about it, but it should not be the vanguard party. We should develop an alternative to it. All right. Well, thanks for like really crystallizing the uh, the, uh, the 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 controversy. That's good, Yvonne. Do I have to go after him? <laughs> yeah. Well, you, can, you can try. You can try, but try. you're not going to succeed. I'll do my best. <laughs> you will not. Succeed. You want to get the, the speaker? Okay. I do well, care. After me, only in the chronological sense. I'm, I apologize. Oh no no no. I thought That's you were okay. going to go after me. 
in the oh, I will, sense. I will too. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not true. After uh, me, yes. No, no, no. I, it, I care about what happens the next day. I care about the state, and and I, I I was thinking about what Macarena was saying about the pink tide, but precisely because of the, all of these things, I think the revolution should still aim. I mean, I think I, what you're saying is true in my paper or what I would present it. I thought it was an affirmation of revolution. Of mm. course, revolution, even now. No, What shape or form is that going to take? I don't know. But it's an affirmation of that, of those memories. No, and um, But it's going to be an armed revolution? I, I don't know. But at least in the case of Mexico, that's what I know best, uh, or perhaps the only thing I know. Uh, the most interesting problems even now are about issues of land and water and small communities. And if all of that will come together at, in some way or another, that would be fantastic. And I, I, to your question, Bernard, about anti-imperialism, of course it is still about anti-imperialism. No matter what form of capital it is there, because precisely extraction, and in the case of Mexico, after the revolution, there was in 1917, as we know, the, the Mexican constitution, which is a revolutionary constitution, which would have allowed, if things would have gone well, to, for that continuity to be there present. And I understand, I, I don't know any other constitution, but I understand from people who know it that it's, a, it, it's really a great revol uh, constitution, the 1917 one, because it's a revolutionary constitution. Uh, and Article 27 was fundamental because it said that all water and all land <coughs> belongs to the nation. That is to say, it takes it takes it, it takes for granted mm -hmm. that private pro a private property is not a given. No, it belongs to the nation, and the nation can allow for private property, which to me is beautiful. And and, and, and to the to the extent that it, that's it's socialism for me. So so it's not private property from where you start. It's from common ground, the common ground of the nation, and and and. The, all the changes to the Constitution in, since 1992 have been to allow extractivism, imperial forces, especially about, uh, around oil, but mining as well. So it continues to be about anti-imperialism, uh, I think. But uh, then going to the question of um, Harris, no? but then we also have internal problems that are, might be relevant or not relevant to anti-imperial forces because they have to do with uh, a history that is very domestic and that which is a relationship between the national state in Mexico and indigenous communities. No? So there are two levels of imperial going on, that domestic one and, uh, and the extractivist one that is international, but it continues. To, so, and, and the fight for these communities, then it's it's twice, it's double because you have to fight Exxon and you have to fight, but you also have to fight your own state, no? Which is it's very problematic. That's why I agree with you. I care about the next day, and I want a revolutionary state. <laughs> so, if if that would be possible, but I don't know if that can be um, or not. And um, so, and, and yes, finally, to Macarena, yes, if the Flores Magón would have, if mm -hmm. that had been the logic of the, of the revolution, because for them, the main source of problem for any society, and if we think about it, all societies are, are, are created or grounded on private property. Mm -hmm. And for them, that is precisely what should mm -hmm. not be allowed. So what would happen if we have a society that is created against private property, no? That it, so it uh, would be a completely different um, society, but that did not happen. And I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to say that I agree with um, Professor Arato, although probably from a, I was coming from a different uh, trajectory and a different background, but fundamentally I, I, I do not disagree. At the same time, I would like to uh, go back and, and um, vindicate uh, revolutions that were made by poets, not by, just by guerrillas and, and by and by politicians like the Sandinista revolution with Ernesto Cardenal and Sergio Ramirez and so many poets and writers and artists. Okay. Now we have Daniel Ortega as an evangelical Christian neoliberal leader. Uh, that's also part of the story, but that has happened also throughout the world. I don't need we need I don't think we need this sharp distinction as the case of Walter Benjamin very much exemplifies. And, and I was indeed talking about the concept of the open as an opening, as, as a moment of effervescence that 
breaks down continuums of history of territories and so on. And yet, um, the, uh, as he reminded us, those are now times. And then uh, Benjamin, in, in, the se in the next paragraph, says we have to bring about the real state of exception that will replace the state of exception in which we live. And we don't know what that real is, so that, that, that organized. But certainly, probably not anymore under a, uh, an enlightened avant-garde. Um, but other, other, other forms of horizontal leadership that are still uh, in the making. And that problem is connected, I think, to, to another institution, central modern institution, uh, to go back to Fadi's point, uh, that we are lacking in a political vocabulary to talk about these things. And uh, I think that is, of course, the institution of the nation state, uh, from imperial powers to resistance to imperialism, all that in the late modern era was played around uh, only within the horizon of the nation state, and we don't have that reality anymore for various reasons that were set, put here uh, on the table. Uh, how can we still think anti-imperialism without the nation state? Yes, I think this was part of Bernard's point. Yes, uh, extraction and extractivism uh, is a fundamental aspect of em empire. Yes, the pink tide, uh, liberal, social democratic governments uh, relied on extractivism, but all, that was also a way of um, avoiding the question of debt and how uh, countries like Argentina and Brazil got rid of the burden of debt and cut ties with the IMF and the international uh, finance organizations. And then you have to rely, I'm not uh, apologizing the, the pink tide governments, but you have to look at this broader uh, mm -hmm. landscapes in the same way that we are not looking at the, at the problem of violence, of political violence. That it's on the table as, a, as, a, as the, the big white elephant that no one is mentioning. But to what extent all the governments and, and political movements that were just mentioned and had uh, failed and had brutally failed in their promise of opening that new, that new level were also constrained by a previous uh, context, not only of, of harsh uh, imperialism and domination, but also of massive political violence that constrains any uh, political project throughout, certainly throughout the global south. Uh, and very quickly, um, something that I'm not going to explain the rise of the global right, but I, I know two or three things that I've been rehearsing. Uh, and very quickly, those would be that liberal democracy is imploding because its own deficits. It's not being threatened from, from outside. And, and also, it's, the global right is in power now because of the massive support of vast masses of subaltern sectors that are either supporting them in the public sphere as assemblies or, of course, through electoral votes. And, and what do we think um, about that? The other, well, there would be many things to say, but the other thing is, again, to bring back my, my main point that we have to analyze these things within the context of finance capital, of the absolute hegemony, uh, finance capital with regard to now uh, industrial capital or production. Uh, in that regard, the absolute acceleration of speed, of velocity of financial capital is producing this deseg desegregation, fragmentation, throughout the world. A working hypothesis would be that the new uh, emerging authoritarian regimes are promising to constrain, to cope with this absolute explosion and velocity of finance, that through uh, getting rid of the, the and this is a ben old Benjaminian argument, the slowness of the temporalities of democratic protocols and so on, through a more accelerated, centralized, authoritarian type of government from Filipinas to the US to Turkey to India, uh, they are offering this promise of constraining the absolutely, apparently, uh, out of control, high speed of, of finance and digital. Thank you. Macarena? Do you yeah, to? just briefly, I really like the question you put on the table about how to think about domestic and international or the, the ways in which we might attend to both of those spaces simultaneously. And I think one way is to understand, again, precisely these kind of global circuits of, um, of culture, cultural production that do a lot of work. 
in fact, and can do a lot of work. So specifically to your example of Brazil, I mean, I'm very interested in the ways in which Black Panther had a different kind of resonance in Brazil, right? And particularly for um, communities, um, you know, favelas, et cetera, and residents that have ha experienced a certain kind of racialized geography and taking back in Sao Paulo kind of the upper varios, the white, wider spaces by occupying the mall and going to see Black Panther and doing it precisely through aesthetic forms of embodied dissent that kind of take back and you know, contaminate or reoccupy those spaces and show the kind of histories of racialization. And I think the example of Brazil is, is really tantamount here because to go back to some of the things that you were saying, Juan, about um, you know, <coughs> movimentos semteras and the landless and, and those kinds of questions, I mean, one of the ways I think we've gotten to the predicament we have now is often you can see the experiments that are happening in the global south and it's a kind of predetermination of what will happen in other places later, right? So um, you saw this kind of wicked backlash in, in Brazil precisely against you know, Lula and Gilma's um, presidencies that were about thinking about racial inclusion and that were putting toward, you know, kind of legislation forward, right? As I, I talk about it really briefly in the blog. But part of that was to say, um, you know, there was a lot of opening in universities to think about affirmative action anew. There was uh, new legislation, for instance, to Quilombo communities that had taken uh, many places in black communities, right, and their kind of struggle for autonomy, and they were legislating in a particular way. And I think you can read the backlash precisely as a racial backlash um, against a kind of anti-black racist uh, backlash. So that's one way for me, um, you know, uh, uh, Fredela de Silva's work is on this, right? Um, Denise, Denise's work is on this. But to think about kind of global race relations and, and a kind of glo global logic, racial logic, that we really, really have to contend with, I think, in order to get out of some of these divides. So I don't know if that addresses what you're saying, but I, I really appreciated the question. Um, and, you know, I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I'd have a lot more to say on okay. art and aesthetics. Okay, okay, yeah. At that. Well, let me pick up on that then, though, because, I mean, one thing that, um, uh, concerned me, uh, Andrew, in your intervention <clears throat> was the, the issues of causation in history. Um, and, um, and I mean, I think, I think for instance, <clears throat> and I don't want to bring us back to the, you know, Occupy movement because we've covered that in other sessions and we're here to kind of broaden the range. But I mean, to say that, you know, the Occupy movement is what has given us Trump well, Which no, is I didn't right. say that. I just said now we have drama. Yeah, I know, but, 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 but I mean, but I mean, so they're going to be they're going to be comp. It gave us Sanders in effect. It gave us Sanders in effect, right? I mean, arguably, and you know, but uh, these issues of causation are really complicated. I think in the historical context. I mean, you know, the negotiated, uh, the negotiated path was much more of a you know was it was a was a was a Clinton Democratic path. Right? May possibly no. I mean, I don't know. So, but well, but the, the issues of causation I don't know are com. Uh, okay. Um, uh, yeah. Right. Okay. But he wouldn't have gotten Trump. I don't think would have been a fair chance to actually win. Right. But so but these questions become complicated, right? Or I mean, in other words, I mean, like you know, do you? I mean, so there was the part of the momentum of Occupy in this country was an aesthetic piece, right? You know, and so, and so, um, so you can't, and then you can't dismiss the aesthetic piece of Occupy from also its political dimensions, its deeply political dimensions, but, um, so they are combined, but you also can't um, dismiss Occupy as an aesthetic movement in part as having produced uh, or as, as having had negative consequences, whatever. I mean, that, that, that's the point. So, I mean, um, insofar as it was nourished by a particular aesthetics, 
it probably wouldn't necessarily have existed in its in its in its form and then you know and then we can have a larger debate and we've had some of these debates already and we'll probably continue for years to come as to what were the what were the ripple effects? What were the, what were the ways in which it changed the narrative, the way in which it did facilitate someone like Bernie um, talking about a notion of a political revolution, which, I mean, he uses that language of political revolution in an interesting way for us uh, today, right? I mean, that's the title of his book, right? Political Revolution. Um, how, how is he willing to appropriate that language today in a way that he might not have been before, et cetera? Uh, okay, um, but I mean, if you can say something about that, I mean, uh, if someone a actually wants to have universal health care in the United States, mm -hmm. if someone wants to have free tuition at universities, if someone wants to have a much higher minimum wage, I mean, you go all the way to Denmark, not really, because Denmark is still pretty far away from that. Now, if you're going to call that revolution, you can call anything revolution. If you want to use term, you know, language. Uh, in a loose way, fine, but that's it's not what uh, what really serious reconstructions or history of revolution mean by revolution. I mean, whether it's Tilly or Scotchpole, or for that matter, Marx and Tocqueville, if you go back to 19th century. I mean, this, the term has fairly clear meaning, uh, right? It means uh, system change. Now, would Bernie Sanders' proposals change uh, American capitalism into some other system? I mean, I voted for him gladly, and I wish he were president, but I don't think that we would have even, we wouldn't even, we would perhaps would have gone a third of the way to Denmark. Mm. Now, to call that revolution, I love Denmark, so no problem with it, but to go a third of the way to Denmark and to call that revolution is intellectually, you know, I like him, I like Sanders, but it's silly. Yeah, so I suppose it does depend on how we would uh, define revolution. But if we do we would define it in the modern conception, yeah, well, right. I mean, well, you talk about political, um, I mean, if you think Little of the... power, Trotsky. That's a very clear concept, right? Okay. Well, also... The sovereignty is meant in Russia. Okay. Changing a system according to rules other than its own rules of change, Kelsen, that's a clear concept. I prefer clear concepts, not this old loose shit. Mm, 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 mm. But I, well, think, I think part of the problem is that we're centering modernity as a site of revolution rather than coloniality and I colonialism. I think part of the problem is we're centering modernity in the modern you know, system rather than coloniality. So in a lot of the conversation, it was interesting when Yvonne kind of said, well, all I know is the Mexican example, right? But that's the 1910 Mexican Revolution, one of the three great revolutions. And everything, I think, in the hemisphere has derived from that and earlier prior to that, not 1917 only in terms of the Ru Russian Revolution and its theorists, but the Haitian Revolution and anti-colonial struggle, which is the reference, right? Um, the Haitian history subsequent to the Haitian Revolution. I, I'm not suggesting that it was successful or failed, but it is part of the kind of historicity that we have to put forward here. You know, so for me, it is about thinking about periodization differently and trying to bring forward certain examples. And Juan, in his presentation, was very subdued when he brought up Hart and Negri. But I'll tell you, from the spaces of South America, the book of Empire is quite a critiqued, very critiqued um, uh, discourse and also in relationship to the narratives because many of those examples are taken from the Argentine case and then inform a lot of the autonomous movements in other spaces, but they're kind of deterritorialized from their original kind of um, successes in Argentina. And also, you know, there, there's a way in which there's a separation of the localities. So I appreciated your subdued critique there, but what I heard was what I hear loud, loud and clear every time I'm in the Americas, how we run everything back through the North American machine of theory making and revolutionary, you know, theoretical production, and then what gets distorted in those amplifications. So I just want to put that on the table too. Okay. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for a heightened discussion. I guess my question, um, maybe a thought, um, has to do with like the concept of revolution, how we've like throughout the seminar uh, focused on present, like past and present forms of political contestation with an anxiously future-oriented question of, is the revolution uh, possible? 
uh, a future revolution in, it, in its like romantic uh, element possible um, in the future. Um, and I guess my question has to do with like under this um, like um, financialized capital neoliberalism, uh, which serves as it seems to be serving as preemptive counter revolution, kind of foreclosing any potential uh, maybe meaningful or like form of uh, revolution as uh, uh, Professor Areto would uh, present as like something that is meaningful change, radical rupture with the current system. Um, where does, like, how does that leave us? Uh, does it leave us like um, kind of like disparate for different forms of uh, meaningful contestation um, in the form of aesthetic instead of like uh, true political change as um, I would sense from uh, Professor Reader's uh, uh, comment? Or is that like kind of we need to shift our, or, or alter the way through which we think about a concept of revolution, a meaningful concept of, of revolution, under this uh, current uh, neoliberal uh, counter-revolutionary force that we all kind of feel and like anxiously uh, today. Can I? Yeah. Um, so I had first I will take you up on the provocation of the metaphysics of presence mm -hmm. that you were mentioning before, and I think. Um, to me, it was, it's also about the question of romanticization and, and getting people out on the streets, but also the question of disaffection. So how this metaphysics of presence is emphasizing a question of the bodily presence because we have become disembodied or something like that. So there's, there's a question about how to mobilize um, without kind of an emphasis on going out on the street. You know, like, what does interruption mean? What does it mean to put your body out on the street? What is the critique of, of that? But also, in, for, for instance, in the Spanish um, context, uh, also the domestic dimension and how precisely there was a critique about how we cannot be mobilized all the time, we cannot be on the streets all the time. So we have to find ways in which um, we can incorporate like, these practices in our daily lives without uh, precisely, you know, th there is a critique of, of that met metaphysics of presence in mobilization that I think is already at the core of how those movements have been, you know, are, are thinking themselves. Um, for the question about the Pactos de la Moncloa, mm -hmm. I think that's a provocation too, especially considering that they're inscribed within a neoliberal turn in Spain that happens in 1950s. Like, you cannot understand the Pactos de la Moncloa without that history behind it, and it's the penetration of like the Opus Dei and the technocrats who craft these packs, um, leading to what, you know, if, if we were to inscribe it in a longer history to today's crisis in Spain on plurinationalism that has been so much attributed to those packs itself. So, so in thinking of like, do, what do we care about the continuity? Well, I, I care very much about the continuity of that kind of history. And, um, I don't see how that can be any kind of model for, um, you know, any alternative. So, and the third thing about maybe about the question of extractivism, and um, I was thinking about the, the paradigm of world ecology. So maybe instead of thinking alienation as a form of subsumption, um, what would it mean to think of capital as a form of world ecology? Therefore, we would have to kind of historicize its processes and not so much thinking as this totalizing force that cancels our consciousness or something like that, but as a historical process that we're part of and to kind of like look at it not as this monster, right, but as something that can be historicized, deconstructed, I don't, I don't know. So, <laughs> so in thinking of like you were saying reprodu uh, social reproduction, um, what's the question of like cheap natures and... Uh, mm -hmm. Like, yeah, thinking about like those gender and racial categories as cheap natures that would be appropriated or, yeah. Okay, I've got, I've got two more questions then, okay? Uh, there, you want to grab the mic from there? <clears throat> um, hi, I'm going to, I guess, make it extremely local and talk about uh, Peru, which is where I'm from and the country that we haven't talked about at all um, tonight. Uh, perhaps because we're not a great example of, of any successful uh, leftist revolutions. Um, Belasco. Yeah, well, Belasco, which I, I kind of wanted to begin there, and for us in many ways, if anything, a, a sort of logistical failure, 
maybe if a, I don't know. I'm just going to leave it at logistical failure. Um, specifically, in light of what came after, um, and kind of in the in the uh, conservative hole we're we're stuck in right now. I mean, last time I went home, it was uh, for Christmas break, and we were in the verge of an impeachment. Uh, our president, uh, Pero Pablo Kuczynski, is I don't know. I'm not going to um, go back to history too much, but he was basically, uh, they discovered that he did business with Odebrecht and uh, different sort of uh, already established political power groups, mostly associated with Fujimori, uh, the kind of 11-year dictatorship we had throughout the 90s, um, wanted to bring him down. And... He, in many ways, got the election because he was in opposition to Fujimori. What ended up happening on Christmas Eve, Fujimori, who was in jail, got released by Pepeka Kuczynski in exchange of uh, voting against, in exchange of a couple of votes in, against the impeachment. So he stayed in power. Um, for us, what's happened, my question goes mostly in relationship to, the, pro to, to the, pol the problem of the politics of memory of the revolution, um, in relation to the current state of the left and Velasco, because what's happening to us, uh, as, as in the Peruvian left, <laughs> um, we cannot, it, it, it really doesn't work. Uh, to borrow discourse, to borrow thought, to borrow language from the agrarian revolution of Velasco, mm -hmm. because it itself is, is more or less universally considered as a, as a logistical national failure. Um, and so what's happening in our politics of memory is not only an intergenerational break in which people that lived through the Velasco regime are in, are in much like blind support of Fujimori and the generations that didn't leave it um, are clearly against that. So my question is, what's happening to the left is that we're learning how to position ourselves uh, in relation to a futurity, so as opposed to Velasco, but looking for a new kind of model of futurity. And so in many ways, this like very dark case of political case that no one talks about, I see it in a certain sense fruitful because this is a point in which the left has to think of itself as a group with a plan that has never been executed before in the history of the country instead of as a revival of the agrarian movement. So thoughts on that would be highly appreciated. <laughs> So one last question. Yeah, um, I, tr I try to be very short. Um, I met you. Uh, I speak as a, an Italian activist uh, close to the autonomous movement in Italy. And what, um, like, when I, when I think about uh, uh, autonomia and uh, self-determination and insurrection, uh, the first thing I, I think about is um, the problem of um, making, like, struggles uh, sustainable on a long term. Uh, that's why uh, how always actually we lose because it's not economically sustainable our activity and then I think about uh, like fragmentation as you said and how we should use the digital uh, uh, social media or whatever as a big problem and also like uh, how we the transmission of our knowledges and for me self-determination is a problem of how we speak into uh, assemblies in uh, in a in a collective situation. That's so. Just uh, great. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's have some final thoughts from our panelists, and we're going to start with you, Macarena, and then we'll oh, work really? back. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. oh, you okay. you want to you want to you, you, you want to go? Okay, you can you, you'll come last. Uh, uh, very we'll go, very we'll go very quickly. Um, go ahead. Where, where, um, Metaphysics of presence, uh, that was uh, the, the Iridian term. Um, of course, uh, because the digital also helps in mesmerizing 
the external observers and, and uh, sacralizing and reifying this moment of appearance and, and assembly of bodies and so on. Uh, the, uh, I think that helps to the short-lived um, uh, life, temporality and failure of many of these movements if they are not absolutely articulated with previous histories of political construction and, and genealogies of struggle. Uh, at the same time, some of these uh, moments and spaces of occupation from the squares in, in the Arab Spring and in, in Greece uh, to, to occupations in Latin America bring the everyday and the domestic to the occupation and, 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 and processes of political construction to some extent. Two, because the occupation is extended in time. But that is one thing, something much more important, I think, and it's not my, my main field. You can see uh, in the women's movement uh, across the world, particularly today in South America, where uh, the, the personal, the domestic, and the political, and the assembly of bodies are very much articulated, very intrinsically articulated, to the extent that the demand is not just, you know, it could have started because of femicidios and, and gender violence and so on, but very quickly became a program around questions of uh, capital and extraction and labor and unrecognized domestic uh, unpaid uh, labor and wage labor and so on. To the extent that when the strike is organized, many, many women cannot participate because they cannot leave uh, not only their, their, their jobs, uh, the positions in the public sphere, but also their domestic. In that kind of movement and other similar movements throughout the world, I think what you were saying is being uh, articulated. And so I can tie that very quickly to, to, to the point. I don't think this moment of financialization and digital capital is any, much, is any more anti-revolutionary than uh, imperial industrial capital was uh, in the way it crushed revolutionary movements uh, throughout the world. The problem is perhaps, as a hypothesis, that the fragmentation on the ground is even more. And the problem of articulation between different moments and spaces of resistance is much more complex or appears as quasi-impossible because of the temporalities, because of the fragmentation. But industrial capital generated forms of artic international articulated resistance in the forms of the, in the socialist internationals and third world movements uh, and tricontinentals and Bandung and, and, and so on and so forth. What kind of transnational articulation is possible today uh, in this moment? Uh, I'll, I'll stop there. But, but just the last Benjaminian point for Peru. Um, yes, re not always revolutions have to bring back uh, genealogies of the past. But when you were speaking, uh, I was reminded of that image that Benjamin has in the thesis of philosophy of history that during the, the night of the French Revolution, revolutionaries were shooting at the clocks on towers to symbolize that a new time of futurity was starting a complete break from the past. So another aesthetic image, if you want. Well, just on, on this one, because uh, this question of capitalism, I mean, uh, now that I made myself unpopular, I'll do, I'll take another step. Uh, you know, we have two systems of modern economy we know, uh, the Soviet type command economy and capitalism. Um, the Soviet type has existed in some versions, but it was more or less convergent. Capitalism, on the other hand, exists in really quite a lot of versions, right? So. Uh, you know, to use the word neoliberal, uh, uh, for Pinochet's Chile and for Denmark, there's something must be misleading about that, right? I mean, I don't know. Maybe none of you care of, uh, have discomfort with, with that, but I think you really should have serious discomfort when categories are used uh, in that way. I, b before I talked about revolution, talking about precisely, well, I think uh, neoliberalism is a category uh, which is misleading because it's not precise enough uh, if, if it includes social democratic welfare states on the one side and an authoritarian regime of the Chilean type on the other, or for that matter, Russia today and China. Uh, Russia, where uh, the poverty level has incredibly increased since the end of the Soviet Union, and China, which has lift, lifted more people out of poverty uh, by percentage than almost anyone in history. 
I mean, enormous number of people now. Of course, they're not wealthy in the U.S. sense, but in the Chinese sense, there's tremendous uh, progress. I'm not an apologist for the Chinese regime by any means, but I think if you are actually thinking of uh, of 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 the problem of of whether it's revolution or insurrection or uh, uh, or whatever it is that you want to call it, uh, the target is important, and. I would bet that in spite of these agrarian experiments, which are quite interesting in local places that many of you talk about, none of you have any idea about what kind of economic system uh, one would imagine beyond capitalism. So I think it would be more fruitful to think about alternatives within it. And unless we have another Marx uh, and his, uh, the few followers, or even if you want, Owen and Fourier, who imagined it before him, unless we have something like that, I think it's better to think about how to make a modern the modern economy, which has this name capitalism, livable, which it is not in lots of places and for lots of people. You're talking about Spain, right? And it's not going to be a model for you. Well, but take a look at the standard of living of ordinary Spaniards as it moves from the 50s uh, to the regime change and how it moves beyond it. There has been disastrous economic policy in the last couple of decades, but still, the level of progress in Spain for ordinary Spanish citizens is enormous. You're shaking your head because you're but privileged you and you don't care, but those... Oh, oh, come like, on. I mean, just, just study it. I think maybe you should have, ec econ mm -hmm. you should have economists mm -hmm. to actually have the numbers mm -hmm. uh, in, in these sessions. Um, I, I mean, but I think, I think Catherine is right about the rates of unemployment for particular youth ages in Spain right now, which is uh, pretty exorbitant. The what? The youth unemploy unemployment rates. I said the policy, rates. especially with the, with the housing boom of the, of the 90s and the, and, the, and the first decade of this century, was a disastrous policy. But that does not mean that uh, in terms of uh, the 50s, which you talked about, the regime change, which I talked about, and the subsequent period, there's not enormous progress. Okay. And you have Before. To see it in a broader context, right? Because you, you were emphasizing the Moncloa Pact. The Moncloa Pact were absolutely opposed by the Socialist Party who campaigned. No, not true. They made it. No, they no, made NATO, it. They NATO made it. was one of the main points of. Gonzalez the made it. Gonzalez. He was there and he made it. Gonzalez campaign against Europe and NATO, the first thing that the Socialist Party did when they took over was to join NATO. And in exchange for joining the, the largest Western military alliance, of What course, harm did that do to the ordinary no, Spaniard that they, you're they in NATO? For, 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 what harm did it do? <laughs> no, no, Have you been in any war of NATO since? For 20 years, NATO, the European community subsidized uh, the Spanish economy from its agricultural origins to what you're referring as, yeah. as was, progress because of the Good thing for the Spaniards. I think they benefited from it. Yes, and you have to see it in a larger, in a larger context. That same economy became the main owner of all the uh, privatized resources and services in Latin America. Huge transfers and subsidies uh, going to the Spanish economy from the impoverished Southern American countries, which now we, we blame the pink type for the pink mm. type. Mm. So if we look yeah. case by case, nation state by nation state, you should have some economists. Okay. Because so um, thanks, Andrew. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. I hear you. Um, before I turn last word for uh, Macarena, I would say I would disagree completely on on the concept of neoliberalism. There is a very tight notion of what neoliberalism is, which is related to Chicago school, uh, Chicago school uh, theories of the market and that were implemented beginning in the 1970s and 80s. Now you can also use the term neoliberal as an adjective to describe particular tendencies in different economic systems, right? So you could talk about neoliberal tendencies in China or elsewhere, but that's not necessarily calling China neoliberal. So, but I think you can have a very tight and clear definition of what that is, and it was predominantly a product of Chicago school economics. Macarena, you want the last word? So, as a Chilean, um, 
and exile, you know, with many tortured and disappeared in, in kind of personal histories. I mean, I think this question is, is really profound to think about the relationship precisely between social debris and the bodies that lie beneath the kind of neoliberal moment, right? Um, that was a Chicago driven and it precisely a, a heightened moment of US imperialism, right? The September 11, 1970, uh, three coup of, of Salvador Allende. Um, I think that one of the things I take from both of these comments about uh, the exhaustion and fatigue one experiences in relationship to trying to be accountable to genealogies of struggle, but also not uh, fall into um, easy traps, right? Um, in terms of trying to enliven struggle is a really important one. And I would say that there's a way in which we have to find and lift those alternative economies, and they're, they're there. There's so many, right, forms of bartering, exchange, ways to lift other, other kinds of imaginaries of economies. And I guess this takes me, you know, to the point that economists can only take us so far in terms of imagining a different future, right? There's a way that we learned in the experience of Milton Friedman and the aftermath of that, that uh, the market was supposedly going to be reorganized by technocracy, and look what it's delivered us. And so I think, especially because I'm in an art school right now, and a lot of uh, makers, creators, um, doers, beers, thinkers, and we all kind of feed each other. I guess I just want to lift, in the end, the, the kind of art of creative struggle as a final word. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. This was a great, stimulating conversation. All right. And I look forward to seeing you at the next, uh, which will be on activism on, I think it's March 22nd, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you all. <laughs>